Um, well, thank you all for joining us. My name is Samantha and I'm with the city of Milpitas and I'll be moderating tonight's program um, along with our sponsor, Bosca and our instructor. I'd like to welcome you all to our class today. Um, all right. And before we begin, I'd just like to go over a few guidelines for successful participation in tonight's class. Um, first, all attendees will be muted by default um, it, just to reduce background noise during the presentation. And we will pause a few times during the presentation so you can ask questions. If you do have any questions, um, there are two ways that you can ask them. You can, one, raise your hand using Zoom. Um, and if you do this, I can unmute you or um, ask your question to our instructor. Or if you prefer, you can also type in your question in the chat and I can read it out or respond to you directly in the q and um, I'd also like to add in that this webinar is gonna be recorded and it will be available to you on the Bosca website and the Bosca YouTube page. So before we begin, I'd like to give you a little bit of information about Bosca. Bosca is a um, special district that represents 26 agencies that include cities, water districts, water companies, and private, sorry, private water companies um, that all purchase wholesale water from San Francisco Regional Water System. And the Bosca member agencies provide water to over 1.8 million people and over 40,000 businesses in Alameda County, Santa Clara, and San Mateo County. Bosque's main goal is to provide a reliable supply of high quality water at a fair price to our agencies and their customers. To remain consistent with this goal, Bosca provides a reasonable regional water conservation program to support the agencies in improving water use efficiency. Um, one element of this water conservation program is the landscape education program. While many efforts have been made to increase water use efficiency over the years, there's still a lot of room to improve. Um, for example, outdoor water use represents the single largest untapped opportunity for water conservation within the Bosca service areas. Um, there are many ways that you can reduce your outdoor water use, such as planting water-wise plants, using innovative um, irrigation equipment, and just being more mindly when um, irrigating your plants. And before we begin, I'd like to um, point out a couple of water conservation programs and rebates that are available. Um, that you might find interesting. Uh, Bosca offers many different rebate programs, such as the Lawn Be Gone Lawn Conversion Program, in which you can get up to $4 back for replacing your typical um, turf lawn to a drought-tolerant landscape using water-wise plants and drought-tolerant materials. They also offer rebates for installing rain barrels, so that way you can harvest rainwater and repurpose it around your yard or your home. And through this program, you can get up to $200 back. Um, they also have a couple of other new programs such as the Smart Controller Rebate and Installation Program, in which you can get discounts and rebates for installing a brand new Ratchet 3 Smart Irrigation Controller. And they also have a Rain Garden Program where you can get up to $3,000, sorry, $300 back for installing a rain garden in your yard. Here in Milpitas, we partner with Valley Water to offer rebates and other water conservation programs. Um, such programs include the Landscape Rebate Program where we offer um, up to $4 back for doing a lawn conversion. We also offer up to $70 per rain barrel if you're interested in rainwater harvesting. And we also offer up to $400 back for installing a grade water system. We also partner with Valley Water to offer the WaterWise Outdoor Survey, which is a really great program if you're wanting to make some changes to your landscape, but you're not sure where to start. With this program, we'll send out a trained irrigation professional to your yard so they can assess what kinds of plants you have, your current irrigation habits, 
and they'll look at your system to let you know if any equipment needs to be repaired, adjusted, replaced. And during the survey, they can also let you know if you're in, if you're eligible for any rebates. Another great way to save water in Milpitas is by signing up with WaterSmart. WaterSmart is our free online platform that's connected to your smart water meter. And what this platform does is it allows you to kind of look and see how much water you're using per day. It gives you very detailed water reports and lets you know what kind of habits you can change in order to save water. There's also um, the ability to set up alerts to let you know if there's a possible leak in your home or um, to be notified if your smart water meter detects that you're using more water than usual. If you're in Santa Clara County, um, you can also apply for the landscape rebate program directly through Valley Water. Um, right now, the lawn conversion rebate is $2 per square foot, and you can find more information on that at watersavings.org. And if you're looking for more landscape resources, uh, we suggest visiting southbaygreengardens.org. There's lots of pictures and guides um, to kind of give you information and inspiration if you're looking to um, transform your landscape. There's also lots of videos available on watersavings.org. And we also recommend visiting bayareagardening.org. Again, there's lots of pictures, plant lists, and watering guides on here that'll help you get started with planting out your garden. And this is going to be the very last uh, webinar in the fall 2020 landscape irrigation, or, sorry, landscape education series, uh, but we will be coming back in spring 2023. So be sure to visit bayareaconservation.org for more information on the upcoming classes. And with that, I would like to pass it on to Juanita. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Samantha. All right, let me pull up my presentation here. And slideshow. Okay, um, again, thank you, Samantha. Um, and um, Hi, everybody. I'm Juanita Salisbury. I'm a California licensed landscape architect. And um, tonight I'm going to talk about designing your drought tolerant landscape. So um, I do a lot of uh, designs here in Palo Alto where I live. And um, you can um, follow me on Facebook or Instagram at the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden. Um, I also have a YouTube channel, Primrose Way, um, and now um, a website, PrimroseWayPollinatorGarden.com. Um, here in Palo Alto, as I mentioned, I do, uh, I designed and installed and take care of uh, a number of different public pollinator gardens that feature California native plants. Uh, the Primrose Way Garden, uh, this is Embarcadero Road here in Palo Alto. Um, Highway 101 is over there. Um, and so if you come into town off of Embarcadero, the Primrose Way Garden is first. A little further down, Gwenda Street Garden, Hopkins Avenue, Arcadia, and Island Drive. And those all feature uh, lots and lots of great California natives. So if you're interested in planting native and you want to see what those plants look like, um, out, out there in the in the wild, as it were. Not that Palo Alto is really out there in the wild, but if you want to see what they look like in the environment growing, um, these are good places to go and take a look. So tonight, um, I'm going to talk in very broad concepts. Uh, I will be giving a few specific examples, but mostly sort of big broad concepts that you can take home with you and then apply those to your specific situation because one size does not fit all for uh, landscape design. And so your needs might be different from your neighbors. And so broad concepts should cover everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about how do you plan your design. Planning is probably the most important stage in designing. We're going to talk about measuring and plant placement. 
we're going to talk about planting, plant function, and some great design tips. We're going to talk a little bit about propagation. We're going to talk about maintenance. We're going to talk about irrigation and water use, and then some final thoughts. And so again, remember, broad concepts, I'll touch on these um, various topics very briefly. You can go more in depth into any of them, but this is kind of like the, the overarching view of how to really squeeze all the use out of every single drop. Um, and in my slides, I try to feature photographs. I do a lot of macro photography of the various creatures that I see using um, the gardens. First thing that you want to ask yourself when you're designing is, you know, you want to set some goals. Ask yourself, what do you want to do in your space? What are your goals? So list the functions that you want. Dining, relaxing, do you want edible plants, trees, exercise, sports activities, entertaining, dog run, cooking, storage? You know, what do you, what's specific for your situation? What do you want to do? And then consider what your style is. Do you have a, a formal or informal style? Traditional, modern, contemporary? So these are things to kind of think about before you even start the design. So really goal setting, you know, um, function is important. And as a designer, um, you know, I always talk about function. What do you want to experience in your space? What is that function of that space? Do you want cool shade? Do you want warm, sunny spots? Do you want a quiet retreat? Again, it's going to be what your relationship is with that space, what you want to achieve in that particular area. Now, um, as a designer, you want to consider movement through your space and, um, you know, just again, function, function, function. What is the space doing? You know, do you have kids running around? Do you have pets? Do you like sports? Not everybody's yard is that big, but you get the general idea. You need space for things. Do you want a pathway? You know, people are going to be moving around outside. So function for movement is the, the critical place to start. So once you've considered the things that you want, um, what's going to be really necessary is to measure your site and to have a very accurate map of your site that you can make your plan on. Um, and an easy to use um, method that I've used in the past, this is an actual um, site measurement drawing that I did uh, for a client, is I use graph paper. And graph paper makes it easy to draw to scale. What do we mean by drawing to scale? One of these squares can equal one foot. And this particular graph paper each of those squares is one eighth of an inch. So the scale is one eighth of an inch equals one foot. So what I do when I'm measuring a site is I lay out uh, measuring tapes and leave them in place. So this is the house along here at the top. You can see there's some doors that swing out, a slider over there, there's a window over there. And I pull a tape straight across usually across the face of a house from fence line to fence line. That way I know I'm, I've got a nice baseline there. And then I start from one side and then go across making measurements from zero. And I put a little arrow here to show which direction I'm going in. And then here at the corner of the house, we have nine feet, six inches, and then so forth, all the way over to the other side at 70 feet, four inches. And then you can pull another tape um, perpendicular to the first tape and I lined it up again with the house to make sure it was straight. And I do the same thing and I just leave the tapes in place um, until I've got all the measurements that I want. You take inventory of what's there, where are the fences, where are the trees, where's the edges of the lawn, the hardscape like walkways, patios, and so forth. Um, where are your downspouts, where's the existing lighting, where are the electrical outlets? You know, are there any other buildings, notable features? And of course, which way is north? So you have a base map then that you can work with. You can, and you can work just with a drawing like this. 
So um, again, you know, look at your site. What do you have uh, on there? Um, do you have retaining walls, you know, existing shrubbery? Do you like to cook outside? Um, this is one of the, the measuring tapes that I use to measure, and we call these soft tapes because you can roll them up as opposed to one of those little square hard tapes that snaps back in as metal. Um, and these are these come in various lengths. I think this might be a 300 foot long. So you can you can get a couple of these, borrow them. Um, from a friend if they have them. They're just very handy. Again, you know, do you, are your downspouts unconnected like this one? A lot of uh, places, sometimes the downspouts will be connected to the storm sewers, which are separate from the sanitary sewer. Um, and the storm sewer is where the, the, the rainwater goes. So again, you know, really kind of get really familiar with your site. Once you're done with that, then you want to overlay your site measurements with translucent tracing paper and very generally show functional areas for activities and then movement between those areas and then planting areas. So this is how design works. Remember, we're talking about design here, and this is about four years of landscape architecture condensed down into a couple of slides. So here is that house that we drew, the fences along the outside. Here's those doors. Here's the window. You can see it. there's some views. Here's a slider here. There's that retaining wall that was going through. These clients had dining in mind. They wanted to do some cooking outside. They had to get out. They wanted a fire pit. So it's like, where does it make sense to put these functions? And they had a great view. <laughs> A tiny view, but we were going to capitalize on that. And then the leftover areas were going to be the planting areas. So that's how you decide where to plant. You know, figure out where the humans go first, and then you figure out next where the plants go. And what we call this in design school is a site-based functional diagram. So it's movement between functions. And then here's a design. This is a design tip. So do your hardscape spaces first, those functional areas like patios, walkways, um, driveways, that sort of thing. And consider the form that works best for your situation. Um, and these are, these are great design tips. If you really want to get something that looks very professional, what I tell people is consider the overall composition. If it looks good on paper, it's probably going to look good in real life. Okay, if it just looks very random, it's probably going to look really random in your yard. It's not, it's going to look like you kind of got handy on the weekends, as we like to say. Um, these are ways to really get a cohesive design, things that look like they relate to each other. So consider the relationship between shapes, you know, use arcs and tangents. So if you do something circular, use a tangent to line it up with maybe something rectangular. That way, these shapes are related to each other. You want to avoid these sort of random sort of curves that don't really have any relationship to anything else. You want to avoid those acute angles. Those acute angles are less than 90 degrees. Those become maintenance headaches, and they're very hard to relate it to other things. And so you want to repeat elements to harmonize composition. So you can repeat elements at different scales. A big arc might be related to smaller arcs that are exactly the same, but smaller. And they can be lined up along an edge. So you can see you can get symmetrical relationships. Um, that's, th this is a design secret. This is how you get a harmonious composition, is that all the elements relate to each other. And so once you have those hardscapes figured out, then you can start thinking about planting. So again, uh, once you decide what kind of forms that you want, and for this particular design, I went with something very rectangular because it worked with the design. It's very modern. Um, and so we had our, our forms just very roughly figured out. You can see I just like slapped another piece of trace paper on the top of um, the very general site-related functional diagram. And so we've 
carved out a little space for the fire pit, carved out a space for the dining room table. Um, you know, so very generally showing then where planting areas would be. And so we can start thinking about where the trees are gonna go. And um, you want always wanna start with trees. Secondly, on top of that, another piece of trace paper goes on top. You can start thinking about shrub masses. Okay, so underneath of uh, the trees. You know, I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science. You just take it step by step um, to get these to show you where you're gonna put things. You know, you may, this may not be a, a, your situation. You may already have a hardscape area, but you still need to be able to design your planting areas. And we'll talk about that too. But if you're starting from scratch, this is a good way to go. And here's another example of drawing to scale. This is actually quarter inch pa uh, squ uh, graph paper. And here's a scale here. It shows that's one fourth of an inch. But um, this can be very handy too, to size things correctly. If you have outdoor furniture that you want to use, measure that and then figure out what would be comfortable for you to place that furniture into various areas. So again, um, you know, design is easy if you take it step by step. So plant layout. Once we've got our hardscape figured out, let's talk about planting areas. Um, again, you know, if your areas are large enough, consider having the path for structure and maintenance purposes. Draw that pathway first. <laughs> Figure out where the humans are going to work out their movements first, and then add your plants from your plant palette, which we'll be building that shortly, um, as circles at their mature diameter. So if they say this plant gets to be eight feet mature, that's the size that you want to draw that circle at. So eight feet across, or however big these are, um, on that graph paper, that way you can accurately figure out how much space that particular plant is going to take. This is very important for figuring out spacing between plants. You don't want to just cram everything like six inches apart because not everything is going to be six inches in diameter. These Some of these plants get huge. And so you want to get it you know, so you're not removing plants because everything is too crowded. So this is a good rule of thumb. Um, plant at things or plan for things at their mature diameters. And most things are going to be really dinky when you start off. And, you know, don't give in to that temptation to overplant because things look sparse. I'm guilty of that myself. It's very hard to really resist that. But this is a good way to get the spacing correct and also to figure out the number of plants that you need. So then you can say, I've got, you know, like seven of the yellow ones here. You can go to your nursery, get seven of those. You can figure out your budget, okay? So um, you can get numbers and you can figure out how much money that you have to spend. So that's very helpful. Um, place your large trees first, then your shrubs, and then your perennials, your bulbs, vines, succulents, and annuals. And remember with trees, you can plant underneath of those. So if you have a trunk here, then you can, you can figure out space uh, underneath for things. So again, the sequence of your plant selection, and we'll talk about how do you select plants, We're getting to that fun part, because there's a reason for picking specific plants, not just for their drought tolerance, but for what they also do. Um, but you want to start with trees. So fit in as many trees as possible, then the shrub layer, and you should have over 60% of your plants should be shrubby. Um, focus on those evergreen shrubs so that things aren't bare, because we, you know, we don't like that dry look. Um, and then over time, add in as many grasses, perennials, bulbs, succulents, ground covers, and vines as possible. You're probably saying, but Juanita, you told me not to overcrowd things. Some plants you can tuck in because they don't get that big, but you want to start with the big stuff first. And then those little spaces that you have left over, that's where you start putting the little things. Um, you want to aim for a mix of herbaceous and woody perennials and plant during the late fall and winter for your best results. So right now, it's planting season. 
planting season is open until about the end of May. Um, and I always try to plant the smallest pot sizes as possible, four inch pots or one gallon sizes, because if you have to plant 300 plants, digging 300 five gallon pot size holes, it's a lot of work. And I've planted hundreds and hundreds, thousands of plants. And if I can get away with seeds, I'm going with seeds or four inch pots because it's just easier. Um, and then when I first put plants in, sometimes they're these little dinky three inch tall plants. I'll use a physical barrier to protect those plants because everybody steps on them because you don't see them because they're so small or squirrels dig them up. So I try to protect things with chicken wire or something to um, keep them until they're big enough so that people will see them and won't step on them and the squirrels can't damage them significantly. I use exclusively California native plants. And why, why, why California natives? California is a biodiversity hotspot. We have almost 8,000 species of plants here in California. Some found nowhere else on the planet. And some are only found in just one or two locations in the state. So super rare things. Lots and lots of our species are drought tolerant. They evolve that way here in California. Um, we have a lot of biodiversity in terms of pollinators, bees. So we have 1,600 species of bees that are native to California, 4,000 across the United States, but we have more species of native bees than any other state in the United States. Um, we don't talk about honeybees. Those are not native, not that important really. Um, and so these plants, as we will see in a moment, are super important to help maintain biodiversity by supporting biodiversity of insects. Um, and we want to do that. Some insect species um, are declining by as much as 70% in places. So it's not insignificant. Um, I like to call this slide my photons to protein slide. Plants are the beginning of everything. And this is, this is the start of why we use California natives and why California natives, aside from their drought tolerant properties, are so critical for water saving and water conservation. So we have energy from the sun getting transformed by plants. This is how it happens. This is the only way that energy from the sun gets transferred into our food web is through plants. No other way. I mean, we have like, you know, petrochemicals and things like that that used to be plants, but literally the only way that we can get energy from the sun into the food web is through plants. Plants are food. And so that food is then eaten by insects and other animals and then gets spread out into the food web. And as we know, insects provide food for other organisms like baby birds, lizards, lots, of, lots and lots of other animals eat insects. And as a rule, native insects only eat the native plants they evolved with. So a garden full, even if they're drought tolerant, non-native plants, they're not going to be efficient in transferring energy into the food web. And the food web is an enormous storage facility for water. And so we're gonna be talking about saving water through biology. It's not a huge amount, but it's like a really important percentage of water. Water is life, water should be stored in living tissues. And so when we have native insects like this caterpillar, that's where the water goes. And then the water gets transferred into the food web where it's super important. Um, so, you know, it's just another tool in our, in our toolbox for water conservation. Um, so, you know, I run into designers all the time who say, oh, I just do the decorative thing. You know, it's like, yes, plants are very pretty. They're very decorative, but they're not decorations per se. They're food. This is their function. And as a designer, it's all about function. And when you're planting native, that means that the native plants in your garden will attract many native pollinators and in turn insects and in turn birds. 
it's a guarantee this will happen. And so native plants then become critical parts in sustaining life. And um, so this is how I choose plants in the nursery. I look for the ones that are really chewed up because sometimes I bring home these larvae, which then turn into butterflies. So um, why is it so important to see plants as food? Because that's what they are, but um, your plants will attract a variety of native pollinators and other insects. So you want to take that next step and avoid making your garden an ecological trap. So an ecological trap is something in the environment that attracts organisms. And because of this attraction, it makes it easier to, for them to be killed through predation or other means. So you don't want to set out the buffet and then inadvertently kill those uh, insects um, by you know, raking up the leaves that they overwinter in or using pesticides and herbicides and things that will kill them. So um, this is the way to retain water in the environment is to plant native and then let these organisms fulfill their life cycles. So here's this broad concept, biological water storage. Plants and animals store water in their living tissues. Um, a small percentage of water storage and water in general is in living tissues, but I would say that that's the most important place for it to be. It's actually fulfilling its function in sustaining life. So in your native plant garden, then to really be super efficient, you want to increase connectivity and complexity. And the more complex and connected these plants are, the more that they support each other and the organisms and in, in that space. And that leads to reduced irrigation needs. So less water use doesn't mean less plants. And we find that the more that we add plants, the more that you build a community of plants and other organisms that support each other and share water, nutrients, and information. And so with the right community of plants, the garden becomes a self-assembling living system that kind of emerges from this complex unit of plants. Um, and it's exciting to see that happen. And I see it happen over and over again in our gardens. So you wanna start, try to get a minimum of 20 different native plant species local to your area. And here I've kind of drawn a little diagram of how I sort of imagine things working in the garden. So things reaching down with their tap roots into the groundwater pulling it up, having cloud formation happening, um, roots underground sharing um, moisture and information uh, about what's happening um, in the environment. Most people don't think like I do, and, um, but I like to think of plants as social creatures because they do share information and they do communicate. And um, one plant in a garden feels lonely. And so plants actually do better if they have the right community. And so the California Native Plant Society um, on their vegetation glossary on their website says a plant community is a group of plant species living together and linked together by their effects on one another and their responses to the environment they share. Typically the plant species that co-occur in a plant community show a definite association in a plant community or affinity with each other. So they all play well together. And, you know, sometimes plants will gang up on other plants and like kill them. Um, I see this happen. Sometimes people say, well, why did this plant die? It's like, well, look at how healthy the other plants are around it. And so, um, you know, mysterious things happen. And sometimes plants will vote off a plant off the island. Um, and so you, ba you basically want to get a, a community of plants going. Now you're going, okay, I have this broad concept, so I'm going to plant native. How do I start? The best place that I have found um, to find what to plant is to use the calscape.org database. This is done by the California Native Plant Society, and it is a database of almost 8,000 plants here native to California. And they feature uh, information and resources, nurseries where you can find plants, and you can even create an Excel spreadsheet 
that um, can become your plant palette. So um, they break it down for you. Um, all plants, trees, shrubs, perennials, annuals, grasses, and so forth. This is just a screenshot that I took of their landing page. Uh, they have a planting guide, which has a lot of great information about, you know, how to structure these plants in your garden. Then they have nurseries where you can, you can say, okay, let's, they've got a list of nurseries that might have a particular plant that you want. You can click on a link that takes you to the nursery's website, and then you can see what they have in their inventory if they have any of those plants. Your plant list, and then butterflies. What's that about? Hmm. Well, when people ask me, what do I plant? I turn it back on its head and I say, instead of that, um, let's consider this question. A better question is who to feed. And when we're feeding insects, we're putting moisture into little insect bodies, okay, where it's gonna do a lot of good in the environment. And here in California, we have 1,368 species of butterflies and moths. Remember when I said that insects are very picky eaters, they only feed on specific plants. These are host plants. If you plant these plants in your garden, that may not happen the first year, but if you plant them, you will end up with these butterflies in your garden if they are local to your area. Almost a guarantee that this will happen. It's exciting to see this happen. I see this happen in our gardens all the time. So, um, you know, biology is such a, a powerful force to conserve resources that, you know, looking at things in terms of like, instead of looking at what to plant, who to feed is such a better question to ask when determining what to plant. And here in uh, Palo Alto, um, these are photographs that I have taken um, of the various species that I have personally seen. This particular skipper butterfly, this is the first year I'd seen it. Um, and look how pretty it is. And this was on the buckwheat over at the Hopkins Avenue garden, feeding on some of the mallows that we have planted there. Um, this little butterfly as well. I mean, look how beautiful with the little blue fur and the checkered wings, the pipevine swallowtail that feeds literally only on the pipevine um, plant. Um, we have that here in Palo Alto, easy to grow plant. Um, here we have the Western Pygmy Blue. This feeds on um, a plant out at the Baylands Park, smallest butterfly in North America, beautiful creature, a red admiral, painted ladies, buckeyes, you know, of course, swallowtails, morning cloaks. You know, why wouldn't you want these in your garden? So, um, you know, again, you know, you create so much beauty with native plants. So how do you start? How do you decide, okay, I want butterflies. How do I just start? So the best way to start is to pick those keystone plant genera. And what keystone plant genera are, are those plants that form the backbone of habitat resources, food, shelter, and nesting sites. And keystone species help other plant species to survive. How do you know what a keystone species is? Keystone plants provide food for dozens or hundreds of types of caterpillar species upon which countless other animals depend. So a keystone, if you imagine a stone arch and that one stone in the middle, that's the keystone that holds everything up. So a keystone plant species, if you have to choose between this or that, and this one feeds a hundred species and this one feeds five, this one is more of a keystone species than this is. This is gonna be a better plant to choose in your garden because when you're feeding hundreds of other things, you increase connectivity in your garden. Remember, when you increase connections, things become much more resilient because you have a lot of things connected. Okay, my fingers are forming this web of connections. And if you lose a couple of those, you still have resiliency, you still have connections. So takeaway technique is to provide, include at least a few keystone plants to enhance and provide a resilient native plant garden.
um, start with your keystone trees and buy trees. Trees help save water. Yay. <laughs> so um, trees absorb water and release it into the air, cooling and cleaning it. They form half of the rain cycle. Teaming up with oceans, they circulate water across the land. Without trees, deserts can form. Trees improve water quality by filtering rainwater and slow down impacts of heavy rain. They reduce flooding and stabilize soil. So that's why I keep telling people, plant as many trees as possible. Um, here in the county, we have lots of great oaks to plant. This is the Coast Live Oak, Quercus agrifolia. Um, this may not work in your backyard because they're really big. This is my husband here who's six foot three inches tall. He's, um, he's quite tall. Um, and so that might not work for everybody. You could, if you want an oak, you might want to go with a scrub oak, which is more reasonable. Um, and they're also the larval food source for the California sister butterfly. Look at her, isn't she pretty? Um, we know that clouds form more often over forested areas than non-forested areas. And the cooling effects of clouds <clears throat> and the carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide capture by trees more than offset the reflection of the sun during times when the deciduous trees are bare. Deciduous trees lose all of their leaves all at once. Evergreen trees maintain their leaves, losing only a few at a time. So again, another reason to plant trees is that they help us conserve water. And, you know, they help circulate water through the environment where it's going to be uh, the greatest use. So you're going, okay, if I don't have that much space in my own yard, what can I plant? And so <clears throat> this is um, a slide of the plants in my home garden. And I have a dinky yard. Um, and I have crammed in so many different trees here. I want, I want all the plants, but I don't have room. This is why I have public gardens because I ran out of space in my own yard. And so I have everything from Acer macrophyllum, um, the big leaf maple. Look at those big, beautiful leaves. And when this thing gets to be its full size, that's gonna have some um, epic shade. I have Circocarpus betuloides, mountain mahogany. This is very a narrow, upright evergreen tree. Excellent, easy to grow, local plant for our area. I even have Salix lazioleppis, the arroyo willow. Yes, a willow in my home garden. I water it by hand when I remember, and it's still alive <laughs> after five years. And I planted it because it's a keystone species. I have Sambucus nigra, the elderberry, Prunus elisifolia, a star by this one because super drought tolerant evergreen, glossy leaves, Acer negundo, box elder. Um, this was our street tree that we had, the Modesto ash. Coralis cornuta, hazelnut. So if you like, if you like filberts, you know, plant a couple of these. Um, and hopefully you'll end up with some nuts sometimes. Prunus virginiana, uh, another keystone species. Arctostaphylus glauca, the big berry manzanita. Super drought tolerant. Cersus occidentalis, underneath a cage here to protect it. Um, Heteromelis arbutifolia, the toyon, super drought tolerant. Planted this, watered it once five years ago. Never watered it since. So toyons, super easy from seed. Um, you know, I have these things coming up as weeds um, in, my, in my public garden. So I end up digging up seedlings and just giving them away because they're so prolific. So lots of choices, people, I don't know what to plant. You know, maybe you can find one in, in this list of a dozen. And that's not even all the plants I have or all the trees I have in my backyard, but these are, these are a, a good, uh, group to, to see if you can find something that would work in your yard. Then you go with your shrubs. And again, these are in my own uh, home yard. And you want to choose something that's local to the area. And here in Santa Clara County, we have 29 species that are native. And I do like a dark green glossy leaves to give that lush appearance to the native garden. Um, one of my favorite shrubs is the Vaccinium ovatum because it has uh, edible fruit. Um, and then if you want 
to have that really lush look, go for about 75% of those shrubs to be evergreen. And that just keeps everything looking lush and nice. Ribes viburnifolium, uh, Arctostaphylus. Arctostaphylus, the manzanita, comes as ground covers, shrubs, small trees. So, and there's so many different kinds of Arctostaphylus. Excellent, excellent shrub, easy to grow. Um, then you wanna go with your perennials. Uh, 53 species native to Santa Clara County. Here we have one of our native bumblebees on Phacelia californica. This actually is Bombus bodnesenskii, the yellow-faced bumblebee. You can always tell because she's got that very distinctive stripe across her butt. She's collecting pollen. Here she is on some Scrofularia californica. You know, lots of things that are super easy to grow. If you really want to store moisture in tissues, plant tissues, try succulents. And succulent comes from the Latin word succus, meaning juice or sap. So it's juicy, right? So this is a great biological water storage device. And so makes these things really drought resistant. And here in California, we have just a cornucopia of succulents to plant. Um, everything from cacti to Luisia, agaves, sedums, crassula, leptocyanes, dudleyas, and even bulbs. Bulbs are considered succulents too because they store water in their tissues. There's some nice bulbs. Lots of things to choose from. 188 species in California that are native. So again, you know, go to town. <laughs> Lots to choose from to store water in biological tissues. I like, personally, I'm a big fan of the Dudleyas. Um, there's about 45 species and they hybridize. Um, so it makes categorization of them somewhat challenging, but you know, um, they're so easy to grow. I mean, here's, I just wanted to illustrate how easy they are to grow. Um, here's one growing literally on a vertical rock surface. You know, it's like, if you want, something that's super easy to take care of. You know, um, Dudleyas, they seem to defy gravity. Um, you know, it, it's not hard. Um, another Dudleya that I have that I like, and you know, some look more dry during some seasons than others. So like the ones that have like finger-like leaves, like this Dudleya Byron's, looks really um, nice and juicy in March. And even in, uh, September during the various dry seasons still looks pretty juicy as a poor opposed to the Dudleya bretonii, which has these two different sort of looks during the year. So, you know, again, it's going to be like, what do you want and how do you want your garden to look? Um, and then, you know, here's a design tip when you're doing gardens. Remember, um, it's like, oh, how do I design? Um, you know, for a lush look, you know, use succulents. So this is actually out in the wild. Here's a succulent. This is a sedum growing here underneath a cedar tree. There's a wild rose growing underneath that. But then we have Arctostaphylus growing right next to the sedum. Um, and sedum and Arctostaphylus work well together. And you get this nice contrast between darker and lighter. And that creates visual interest. So yet another design tip dark and light create visual contrast, something nice to look at. And then again, um, you know, lush looking evergreen plants also provide edible fruits. And so these are in my own backyard, uh, Vaccinium ovatum, or otherwise known as our native huckleberry. These are these tiny blueberries that are intensely blueberry flavored, delicious. Um, and you want, if you want them to grow faster than they normally would, feed them cotton seed meal and they'll grow about one to two feet a year. That's a, the secret, secret garden tip, cotton seed meal for the Vaccinium ovatum. Back, uh, they love it. It's like candy. And mine, I put some down this year. One of them grew two feet. I kid you not. I couldn't believe it because they're really slow growing otherwise. And then I like Fragaria vesca, the wild strawberry. And these strawberries, even though they're small, intensely strawberry flavored, they're like candy. So what's not to like? Storing, again, storing that moisture in living tissue. So this, this uh, moisture 
uh, laden strawberry went into my living tissue. So I'm uh, storing the water. Another design tip, um, you can have single plants be seasonal accents. This is uh, a ceanothus at our, <clears throat> I think this is out at the uh, Gwenda Street Garden. This is a variety that I like called Valley Violet, blooms early with a beautiful blue flower, really a nice showstopper. Another design tip, monochrome color scheme um, with a contrast in texture and scale. Um, again, another contrast, blue uh, versus green gray. And this is out at the Island Drive Garden. So again, a lot of visual interest. Some people say, oh, native plant gardens are ugly. You know, don't believe it. It's not true. They're beautiful. Look how pretty this is. So um, don't be afraid of native plants because they are, they are just, they can stop traffic with their beauty. Um, you know, again, you're probably going, yeah, how am I going to afford a lot of these plants? Grow things from seed. It's pretty easy. Um, I grow a lot of things from seed because some things that I want are not available um, in nurseries. Um, and, you know, I like to know everything I can about plants uh, because it informs my decision as a designer. Um, and so seeds are great. Um, it also preserves genetic diversity, which is um, what it's all about. And I do what's called cold moist stratification. Um, if I want to get seeds started and I, because sometimes seeds don't germinate quickly. What I do is I take a wet coffee filter, I'd label it, um, put the seed in there, stick it into a plastic bag and shove it in the refrigerator. And I check it every couple of days until I see that a root tip poking out. So I know about how long it takes. Um, and it doesn't have to be expensive. You can see I've really, uh, not spent a lot of money using an egg carton. Um, and my tool here is a toothpick to get that seed planted up. And seeds are cheap. And you can grow hundreds of plants that way. Um, so super affordable. Um, you know, and you could do things by cuttings, like here's a sedum that I've started um, just by putting it into the ground. And Dudleyas, again, my favorite babies. Super easy from seed. Look at all these babies coming up. And look how juicy they are. So easy to grow. Okay. Once you've, you've measured, you've planned, you've thought about function, you've got your keystone trees and shrubs, you know, how do you take care of it? Well, the good news is that native gardens are less maintenance than a non-native garden with lawn. Not only do they use less water, but it's actually easier to take care of, care of them. Basically, you want to just keep the weeds at bay. So get the weeds out. Um, irrigate your plants to establish about once a week or so. And when you irrigate, you should encourage the roots to search for water. And roots will go towards water. That's what they do. That's their job. And so water deeply outside of the root, just outside of the root ball. You don't want to be right on top of that root ball because then you end up with this wet mass of roots that might rot, especially if it's warm weather. So encourage those roots to seek out moisture. And as those roots go out, they will find other plant roots and they'll be like, oh, hello. And they'll meet up and they'll start doing their root things underground where they talk and share information. Um, prune sparingly. Um, I mean, if you want to, I rarely prune. Um, I we just basically do it to control some of the, the dead material for fire safety. But I generally leave seed heads in place because those seed heads attract birds and insects. And um, other animals will use the fluff from certain seed heads to uh, line their nests, hummingbirds. And hummingbirds nest in January. So I leave the fluff until um, there is no fluff left. Um, you don't need to fertilize at all. You amend very sparingly. And we initially mulch to control weeds and help establish the plants. And then we mulch with leaves. So we, when leaves fall from trees, we just leave them because the, the tree basically has created these leaves over the course of a year. And those leaves are nutrients that the tree has created. And those leaves drop down 
and then feed that plant because that's what that's that's their job. That's what the leaves do. Um, people say it looks messy. Well, then you can come back in with a one chip thick layer of bark mulch if you don't like the way the leaves look and just do a little skim coat and nobody will know that it's not three inches thick. Um, you can leave areas of bare dirt because 70% of bees nest underground and so they appreciate some bare dirt. And don't use leaf blowers in your planted areas. Um, if you use a leaf blower to clean off hardscape, you know, and it's a uh, law, you have to use an electrically powered blower. Um, it also reduces fumes and emissions when you can use electrically powered equipment. Don't use pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. Remember, these organisms will come to your garden um, because it's food and who doesn't like food? So that's, that's what happens. Um, irrigation, rules of thumb here. Um, you want to plant during fall, winter, or spring when the soil is cool. This is key to making those plants really establish. Plant small, one gallon or smaller. Water one to two times a week just outside that root zone to help the roots seek out moisture. If there's no rain, and we're supposed to get some good rain on, on Thursday, which is good because we're up doing some planting. You wanna research the water use of your plant, very low, low, medium, and high. Next slide tells you where to find that information. Use mulches, boulders, and shade to reduce moisture from the soil, moisture loss from the soil. And then once established, water as recommended. And Calscape goes into how often things should be watered. And people ask me about underground drip. It's really not suitable for native plants. Um, most native plants don't grow in uh, seeps where there's underground moisture. Most, a lot of native plants rely on rainfall. So that's why we um, water from the top down. We don't water from underground because that's not good for most native plants um, that don't grow in seeps. And we don't water during hot temperatures uh, because we don't want hot, moist soil that encourages bad pathogens. We want to water when it's cool to avoid uh, that warm, moist soil. And then Calscape has that planting guide, again, that goes into more detail about irrigation. So this is how you find out uh, where uh, plants can be very low, low, medium, high uh, use water, uh, water use plants. So what does this mean? So the water use classification of landscape species is an online searchable database for plant factors of individual plant species. Here's the website here. Um, and what this is basically is plants can be ranked based on the percent of water use of turf grass. So turf grass is 100%. And that's the reference against which other plants water use is measured. So that percentage of the reference is called the plant factor. They should just call it percentage. Um, and so a very low water use plant of zero to 10% is zero to 10% of what turf grass would use and so forth. Low is 20 to 30% and so on. So, you know, in deciding what to plant, keystone species, trees, and then, um, you know, how much water does it use? If you can get away with planting very low and low water use plants, that's a good um, decision point to use when determining what to plant. So again, among the other goals for native plant gardens, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, aside from the water conservation, um, remember the water is not just in the plants, it's gonna be in these organisms. So you wanna, re you wanna optimize the reproductive success for the insects that use those gardens. So that's how you keep moisture in the environment is you let these organisms complete their life cycles. And a native plant garden with its abundant blooms with nectar and pollen for bees and host plants for butterfly and moth larva, they'll be very attractive for these insects. And remember the trap is something in the environment that lures those insects into a habitat, habitat that is unfit to maintain them and they cannot complete their life cycles. So what I tell people to do aside from gardening um, and to keep water in your environment is to reduce outside light pollution at night. Um, and this is a moth outside of 
a window at my own house before we put up some blackout curtains in our windows. Because this moth here, I look at this moth, I see a moth, I see bird food, but I also see moisture. And this is a moisture storage device. And if you start thinking about it like that, it's like, well, of course, then I'm going to put up um, blackout curtains or use maybe motion sensor lights at night or um, yellow light bulbs that don't attract insects as much because, you know, it's like kind of a different way of thinking about it. Light at night attracting these little bags of moisture, you know, it's like, how can we be really efficient? And this is an efficient way to, to help. So, um, you know, there are lots of other ways to, to really optimize the reproductive success or optimize the way that we're using water, which we've already talked about. Uh, but a huge one is really reducing light pollution at night. So some final thoughts. I know it's a lot to think about. We've covered these big, broad thoughts about using biology and all kinds of data to really select the species that are going to help us squeeze the most use out of a single drop of water. Um, but among the other ecosystem services and saving money on the water and maintenance, the more that you understand interrelationships in nature, you will learn how to optimize the productivity of your native plant garden, leading to an abundance of life, as well as the enhancement of your appreciation in rural and caring for nature's complex beauty. And these really encompass everything that I know, mostly in broad strokes, about really how to rethink how we use moisture and how we use water and where it goes and what it does, and really think about you know, everything that's living as a potential place for moisture to be and to really be as um, efficient as possible in our decision making. Remember people, form follows function. Remember the function of all things, the function of plants, the function of water is to keep things alive. And with that, um, I'd be happy to uh, take any sort of questions. Of course, so we have one question in the chat from Sona. Um, they have a few questions actually, and they're wondering if maybe you could provide some guidance with their project. Um, let me see. Sona, would you like me to unmute you? Here, let me try that. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Sona. I've um, allowed you to unmute yourself whenever you're ready. Hi. Um, Sona, I have a couple of questions. I'm actually... Um, working on a single family house in the in Hayward area. And I needed some support with irrigation plus planting and stuff like that. Um, I'm, I had a landscape architect licensed and he's no longer on my project. I don't know what happened to him. So um, I need some guidance to assist the staff who's currently working on my job and um, help them out with some Questions regarding like dripping versus kind of like spray systems. Um, since Janelle is actually a licensed uh, architect, she might be able to guide me a little bit. Yes. Um, <laughs> so what I recommend to people, um, I'm sorry about your landscape architect. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a typical landscape architect in terms of my approach, which is more biology based. Uh -huh. um, I also have a, a degree in another degree in uh biology where I actually studied eating and drinking. Um, mm -hmm. Funny thing, now I use that in design. Um, so what I tell people um, to kind of keep your project moving forward is to, um, you know, enlist um, somebody who works specifically um, in these native plant type gardens um, to really, I mean, really a native plant garden is going to be your most efficient way to save water. Um, okay. And 
the California Native Plant Society on their website has a list of resources, including contractors that do this sort of work um, where they install drip systems and um, spray systems as appropriate and can really address all of those concerns. And so I would go to that research pa resource page um, on the California Native Plant Society website. The Santa Clara Valley chapter is the one that you want. Um, and they have the local people and they break it down into designers, contractors, and then contractors who also design. Um, and there are, there are people who do really good work and you know, I'd go to their websites and take a look to see um, who looks good to you. I, I personally, for my own home garden, I use a service because I'm just so busy um, mm -hmm. and I'm very particular. Um, so, um, you know, I can give a shout out to her. It's California Native Scapes. That's the one I use, but there are other ones. Um, but I, I like her personally myself. Um, I'm really picky. <laughs> <clears throat> My issue is that um, I have the landscape plan that is already done, an irrigation plan that was done by the architect, and I did hire a licensed um, landscaper, and both of them are gone. So now I'm I only have a staff that was working with this landscaping, our um, licensed landscaper, and they have designed these things um, and have done the irrigation system per the plan. Yeah. City of Hayward is very particular in regards to following to the team yep. Yep. exactly what's written, what's pointed out, what plants have been pointed out. So exactly. So we're following to the right. team what's needed. The only issue I'm coming across is in we had to plant something that was called, I guess, a delta, delta blue grass from native that is native mofri grass that required a drip system. And this landscaper has installed a spray system for it um, because the drip system that we were unable to find because this drip system, I guess, is probably gonna use a lot more water than it was supposed to be using because they're bigger mm -hmm. gallon per hour drips. So it's like, it requ our plan required like a half inch drip system, but they only have like 0. 0.6 or 0. 0.9 or 0. 0.12 gallon per hour every 12 inches. So that was my main issue. I don't know how to handle that or should we just stick with the spray system? So, um, you know, I, I love Delta Bluegrass and I, that's what I always specify, the, no, the NOMO. Um, and, um, you know, what I, I, you know, I can't make a professional recommendation, but um, if they do a spray system with that, you can get some high efficiency uh, rotors rather than a spray spray. Um, okay. and that's what we use in our public gardens and they're actually pretty efficient. Um, the, they don't like mystify the water. They actually send out more, more bigger droplets. Mm -hmm. So um, the high efficiency rotors are actually pretty good. Um, but you may want to check, um, you know, again with your, um, with the, with the city because I know, I know what you're talking about. I do design irrigation systems. Mm -hmm. And cities are really particular when you're doing new construction about making sure that you're, um, you know, that you've you figured out down to the gallon how many gallons of water you're using every year um, for your landscape. Um, yeah. And so, um, um, you know, it may be if you're the people who were um, running the project are no longer there, you may need to have a, another project manager. Um, okay. to kind of oversee things. And that's why I would recommend getting another contractor to come in to maybe do some project management for you. Okay, yeah, that would be helpful because I do need to have somebody to sign some documents and do create this maintenance plan for irrigation and landscape as well as, you know, uh, yeah. doing an irrigation, I guess it's a schedule to kind of let them know how much water is being used per month right. per gallon. Yes. <laughs> So, um, all right, well, that this is very helpful. So I'm gonna try to see if I can find, but you, as you recommended, going to that particular website and see if there, I could find additional contractors through yeah. that. It, yeah, the California Native Plant Society, the Santa Clara Valley chapter, uh, super active, great chapter of people. And they do have a list of 
um, professionals who are, um, you know, native plant expert types. And um, that would be a good place to start. And, um, you know, just see who's available, see, take a look at their website, see if you like their work. Um, and then, you know, have a conversation. Okay. And like you mentioned in your slide that it's best to just water plants like once a week or once or twice a week instead of so many since all of my plants on my plan are actually completely drought tolerant. <laughs> yeah, well, you're going the first year or two, um, you know, plants need to get established. They're not going to be drought tolerant immediately. Okay. And we, yeah, and what establishment means is, remember when I said that roots need to go out and seek water. Uh -huh. and they're not actually just seeking water, they're seeking out each other. Um, mm -hmm. They're seeking community. And okay. that takes a while for them to find each other. Um, and so usually by the end of the second year, that's when I consider most plants um, to be established. You know, if they're not going to do well, you can, you can see that by um, the end of the second year. If they're just like not happy, um, that's one way. You know, something that I also recommend doing planting uh, or during planting is to inoculate the soil with an ectomycorrhizal fungus. And if you can find a local source of uh, an ectomycorrhizal fungus, um, that's what I would do. Um, and just kind of, you know, sprinkle that around the top of your plants, underneath the mulch maybe a little bit. Um, and what I mean by ectomycorrhizal is that underneath the soil surface, we have fungus. And there are a couple of different types of fungus, endomycorrhizal and ectomycorrhizal. Ectomycorrhizal wraps itself around the roots of plants and takes mineral from the soil, gives it to the plant in exchange for carbohydrates. And so that's, once you have that association, um, in the soil with the plants, the plants are going to establish better because they're they're getting they're getting something for their carbohydrate production, and so that's part of that plant community that happens. You can sometimes see that uh, mycorrhiza in the soil if you maybe pull back the soil and you see all that, these little white fibers in the yeah. soil. That's mycorrhiza. That's what you want. That's what you want to see. Um, okay. And that's why I tell all people also to leave leaves because leaves are fungal magnets. They will get fungus growing quickly um, okay. in, in the garden. And yeah, so um, if you can find a good um, ectomycorrhizal, a local one, um, I would go ahead and inoculate the soil with that. Um, okay. Yeah. So just put it like underneath the mulch area or... You don't need much, yeah. Um, I actually harvest a lot of um, uh, of the fungus um, that I find coming up in my own home gardens. Uh, which, when you find when you find the ectomycorrhizal blooming in your in your garden, that's how you know that you're doing it right. Um, and on my um, my Instagram and Facebook pages, I actually have a few pictures of that what that fungus looks like. Okay. The scientific the scientific name for that is Pisolithus tinctorius, otherwise known as dead man's foot fungus. It's very, it's when you see it, you you think, oh, this is an ugly thing, um, and it's not pretty. But um, that's whenever I see one, I like pull it out of the ground because I know it's going to help my uh, plants establish better. <laughs> So that's a, another little secret tip that I like, the magic powder. Um, they just crumble the, crumble the mushroom into, uh -huh. the, um, into the planting hole a little bit. And that seems to help a lot. Great. I can find a picture of it here. Um, but if you, if, you, you know, if you go to the Primrose White Pollinator Garden Instagram page and kind of scroll back through where I'm digging up a mushroom, um, uh -huh. I think I have a fairly recent, um, a fairly recent uh, a post <laughs> where I'm showing them, looking at my uh, phone to see if I could find a picture of one. Um, but they're pretty distinctive mushrooms. Um, okay. And you can also just like look it up, um, Google Piso 
Lithus, P I S O L I T H U S, Pisolithus tinctorius. And once you see one of those things, you know, you're like, ah, oh, Pisolithus. Okay. Hey, I'm not I'm not that good with planting. This is the first time I'm ever doing any kind of gardening or planting. Well, <laughs> so well, this you, first project. You'll love it. You love it. And you'll want to do it even more once you see what happens because it's like um your garden will turn into like this super organism. Mm -hmm. this, like I talked about these living systems. Um, and it's like a personality will emerge from that. Yeah. I know it sounds kind of like, ooh, you know, like weird and, you know, weird and airy fairy, but it's actually like a real thing that happens. Yeah. A uh, final question I had is like, so with this irrigation system and with planting, um, I was not part of my landscaping plans when these plans were drawn, but after realizing being approved that there is a, so outside my house, it's like a, a main road. And then be, in between the road and the sidewalk is a little planting area. And there were already like this um, purple plum trees that have been there since I've owned this lot for over 15 years and they have like no irrigation system or nothing. And then now the city is requiring me to put two plum trees, the same ones, mm -hmm. and additional uh, little like um, shrubs that are called like Clara, Clara or something, Indiana, India Hathaway, Hathorone, I guess. Oh. I'm not good with the names. So I'm not understanding what is the main purpose of putting in drip irrigation system onto those i kind of got it you said that first two years they need some water to grow or something yes but for like long term because for 15 years since i've owned this lot these 10 at least seven of them seven plum trees are outside and two other green trees are outside that have not received any water that i've seen they're just there um so I'm not sure why would the city would require me to do this. That would be a, a question for for the city. Okay. Um, I would, you know, if the the plants that they're suggesting, I would come back to them and say that you have an alternative uh, plant if they're not a native plant, because mm -hmm. the, the strip between the sidewalk and the street is actually city property but they expect the homeowner to take care of it. At least that's how it works in, here in Palo Alto. Um, this area is also known as the hell strip, um, okay. you know, because it's hard to get things to grow there. Um, and, but they're really a good opportunity to, um, to really connect different areas because they are a linear pathway. So it can be like, like a nice little corridor um, between properties. Um, so you, you know, so it, it sounds like what they're asking you to plant there is not native, and there may be some native Arctostaphylus, the manzanita, that would work even better in those places that, you know, would require almost no water um, okay. and, you know, once established. So I would go back to the city and you could say, look, you know, um, you know, can, can I plant these instead? And you can give them all the reasons, you know, say, you know, this plant is native and it will help save water and it will, you know, um, not be an ecological dead end like this other plant that's not native. And, you know, you can offer, you know, offer something better than, than what they're doing and, and see if you can, um, you know, have a nice conversation with them about that. And, you know, I will try, out my, the, I try my best. It hasn't been <laughs> successful in the past because I'm allergic to plants. Yeah, so exactly. In order for me to plant all these, I have 206 plants to plant. <laughs> and I don't know how healthy I'm going to be around these plants. So, but manzanita, according to my plan, says it's going to grow like six to 12 feet tall or spread some, that far. Some, some of the manzanitas can get that big. There are mm -hmm. other types that stay smaller. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you can go on Calscape and like, go through the list. I mean, there are so many manzanitas to choose from. Like I said, there are ground cover types. Yeah, um, they need a ground cover type because the one that the Indiana Hawthorne is only like three to five feet 
oh, and that kind of spreading cool. and stuff you know like I, I know i know the indian hawthorn plant that is like the worst and you know i would say you know i would go back to the city on that one and just okay. say you know this plant is an ecological dead end here's a substitute that looks almost exactly the same um mm -hmm. and there are manzanitas that would swap out and you know they would not be able to tell the difference in terms of form and height but it's just a hundred percent better okay sounds good yeah. thank you for your advice i really really appreciate it my pleasure thank you have a nice evening Thanks. i don't know if there are other students hope i didn't bore anybody else with all my detailed questions about I'm, that project. hey i'm here to share the wealth so <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Sona, for asking your questions. Um, we have one more question in the Q&A. Um, they were asking if you could talk a little bit more about grasses. Do they support biodiversity of life? And if so, are there any particular um, types of grasses that you like or would recommend? Yes, is the answer. I love grasses. Um, and there are just so many different types. Some of them are, you know, kind of seedy and will self seed themselves everywhere. Um, and like the Elemus californicus is pretty seedy. Um, I tend to like um, one, one that I'm really liking these days is vanilla grass or sweet grass. And um, that actually grows in a shadier situation with a little bit more moisture um, but it's really worth it because it just smells so good it smells like vanilla um, because of the coumarin in the in the leaves um, and that's like it's sweet grass. i mean it's just wonderful that one's a really nice one and i haven't noticed it being so i wouldn't call it invasive i like to use the word seedy for it um, Another one that I have is, um, I've been like, I replaced my lawn with um, Agrostis palins, which is one of the mixes that's in the Delta bluegrass, Agrostis palins mm -hmm. and um, Festuca rubra. Those make a nice kind of like a, a lawn for you. And I just, I mean, I'm the laziest person. I just take a bag of seed and throw it out there and see what happens. Um, and so I've used, if you want like a lawn area, um, there are other clumping grasses that are really nice that are not particularly seedy. One that I like because we're kind of coastal here. And so, I mean, it's, it's the bay, but it's still the coast as far as I'm concerned. So I like um, the, the coastal hair grass, Deschampsia case pitosa. Um, which is just a beautiful low mounded grass that has these beautiful seed plumes when they um, when they first emerge they're kind of like this metallic green and then they turn into a brown seed head later but when they first come out they are just spectacular so those are just a couple that I've been experimenting with um, there are some that are that have a, a nice wide um, leaf blade which they just, they just look chunky. And of course, everybody's favorite, Mullenbergia rigans, which is deer grass. And um, there's so many reasons to get into native plants because of their, um, they have a number of different functions other than just the, the plant function and the environmental function. So I've been really getting into plant fibers so and making cordage out of things and weaving with plant fiber and so Mullenbergia rigans deer grass has one of the longest seed stalks and that was actually used by the the native americans to create baskets um, so it's one of those one of those very useful fibers so i'm also i'm always looking for ways to find other functions for things because you know it's it's a way to find a relationship with those plants. And once you have a relationship with something, it's kind of like you understand it a little bit more. And so um, I, I love deer grass for that aspect. It's very ornamental looking. Another function that it has is that once the clump is really big, it's actually shelter during the winter 
for bumblebee queens before they establish their nests. So bumblebee queens will like to, they like to over, overwinter as if we have a big winter here. They like to overwinter, they go under leaf piles and under shrubs that have kind of like formed these little shelters and they hang out there until they, they find a good place to um, create a nest. And so, um, you know, so those are, those, those are just a few grasses that I like. Um, you know, some, some I planted um, over at the uh, Primrose Way garden that it was a mistake because they're seeding themselves everywhere now. And it's just like, do I pull them out or do I try something else? You know, I'm always, I'm always hesitant to pull things out unless they're like really happy and vigorous because <laughs> I'm going to have grasses everywhere. Like some of them are just more seedy than others. Um, but those are just a few that I like. Um, and, um, you know, the festucas are just a nice uh, grass to use. But I would say um, check out if you can find some native plant gardens where they may have demonstrations of different grasses. I know that here in Palo Alto, there's a, a demonstration garden at the Eleanor Party Park. Um, where they've got different grasses growing. You can take a look at that. Um, you know, the California Native Plant Society's CalScape website, you can read about the different grasses on that and make some uh, decisions. Some of these grasses also have really long root systems that help actually channel water into the groundwater when it rains, yet another function. So, you know, it's once you start researching these plants, it can be kind of like you go down a rabbit hole of information because there's just like so many things that they do. You know, it's just like, it really changes the way that you think about plants. You know, as a landscape architect, what I was trained it was that plants, you know, they function as screens and hedges. You know, they have forms and textures. They never, never once talked about them being food, ever. You know, I remember going around with my instructor and he's like, oh, this has such clean foliage. It hasn't been chewed on. It's like no insects on it. We thought that was good. And actually now we're discovering that that's not good at all. <laughs> you don't want that. That's not helping. Um, and so, um, you know, people say, well, won't, won't my plants get eaten down into a nub? And it's like, not really. Some things will get chewed up a lot. What that means is that you need to plant more of it because it's a popular, tasty food item. And then the more that you plant, the more biodiversity you have and the predators will come in and things will balance themselves out so things won't get chewed down to a nubbins. That only happens when things are out of balance and you don't have enough diversity. So we started off with grasses and then I started off down in a yet, yet another rabbit hole. Um. I have another question about grasses in the chat from okay. Sona. Yes. Um, she's asking if Delta bluegrass is actually mow free, just wants to verify that they won't need to mow it. Um, as far as I know, you don't need to mow it. Although some people do mow it like once a year. Um, you know, I think it's really up to you. Um, it depends on, you know, what you're comfortable with. Um, for me, I mean, in my own little front yard that I have where I've thrown in the grass seed, I don't know how big your, your yard is. I mean, when things get looking kind of clumpy and stuff like that, I'll come in with actual hand pruners and just prune it down a little bit. But I haven't mowed my own lawn for several years. Um, but I do, I do occasionally will come down with the clippers and clip it down. Maybe, maybe once a year if I'm feeling ambitious. But I also have other things growing in the grasses. So I've got strawberry plants and violets in there as well. And I keep tucking in different kinds of grasses instead among all the other grasses so that it, you know, it looks even more textury. So, um, but that's my own personal preference. Awesome. And then another question from Sona. Um, and Sona, feel free to unmute if you'd like to add on as well. Uh, she was told not to plant any fruits or veggies because they require more water and the city won't allow it. Do you have 
any advice about that one? Oh, um, well, you know, those particular plants um, are, they can be high water use, certainly. Um, you know, but if you do want fruit things, I would, I would plant like native fruit things that are very low water use, you know. Um, if you wanted to have fruit stuff growing, um, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I wouldn't go against what the city is requiring you to do. Um, but if you can find a, a low water, water alternative, um, or if you are interested in having some, you know, a bed for vegetables, maybe get some container gardens going, you know, of things for tomatoes or peppers or whatever it is that you might want to grow as annuals. All right, and Sona says, thank you. <laughs> Good luck with that one. All right, um, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to raise your hand or type it in the chat. Yes, well, I would totally invite everybody to uh, take a look at our gardens that we've got um, here in Palo Alto. It makes a nice little day trip around. Um, just to look at things. Um, and, you know, don't be afraid to just plunge in and design it. There's almost no way to do it incorrectly. You know, if you, if you put in your keystone species, you try to let things kind of find their own balance and, you know, not be too impatient. I mean, nature tells us to be patient um, because things, the, you know, gardens are very dynamic. And so the purpose, the function of things don't reveal themselves all at once. So an example here is I was going out to the primrose garden and uh, I was going to clip down the goldenrod that we had because it had gone to seed. The seed heads were looking fluffy and scraggly and not good. So I was out there with my hand pruners getting ready to shear off the tops, and usually when we do that, we actually just pile the, the garden stuff right there. We don't take anything out of the gardens because those piles have a function as well. They break down, they feed, they feed the detritivores, um, they provide shelter and so on and so forth. Um, and things still eat the seeds. But as I was out there, and this was January of this year, a hummingbird flew in started picking the fluff right out of the flower heads, you know, from the seeds where they had been. And I was like, I did not know that hummingbirds nest in January. I did not know that. Um, so it's like, okay, you know, I, I got a smackdown from nature to like leave it alone. It has a purpose, not your purpose. It's the hummingbird's fluff. So, all right. So I was like, okay, my day just got shorter. I can just head back home and have some more coffee and come out when the fluff is gone, maybe. And, um, you know, so a lot of it's just kind of like, you know, when people do gardens, and I, I run across this with clients sometimes, is that they see a garden as a, a static art piece. And, it, you know, an outdoor environment is just not like that. There's life everywhere. And it's going to be dynamic. Things will live. They will go through their childhood phases, their teenage phases, their adult phases where they're fruiting and flowing, throwing out flowers and fragrance. And, you know, then things die. So, you know, there's a life cycle. Some are, some are short, some are long, some are centuries. Um, so, you know, don't be afraid. Be patient. Um, you know, or be lazy and let nature show you what she wants out of your garden. And she will show you. Hi, Janita, I had another question. Do the root barriers actually work? Like the ones, like the, the cloth kind that they want to kind of roll it out on the dirt in between the plants? Um, uh, you know, so what you're thinking about is like a weed barrier, right? A weed yes, mat? Yes, yes. Do not use a weed mat. <laughs> okay. Do not, 
No, because they do not work. Um, I actually have seen weeds growing up through fake grass. Uh -huh. <laughs> so um, those things add plastic in the environment and they also form a barrier between things that need to get into the soil like pollinators because 70% of our native bees will nest underground. They cannot get through those weed mats. Um, okay. Oh, thank you for bringing that up. That's actually, I'm gonna include that in my next talk next year. It's like weed mats are so problematic. Oh, um, actually, we, they already installed it in mine. Um, have them pull it out. <laughs> okay, we have spent over like two, three grand on that. They were rolls and rolls because we have a very big project. Oh man, those things, unless they are made of like um, non-plastic things. I'm not yeah. sure what they're really made of. It's I don't think they're plasticky, but I'm not sure. If they're, really made, sure. if they're made of, if they're made of paper or cardboard or something oh, no. that decomposes. No, I think they're then they're actually plastic because they have a little cloth underneath and it's kind of shiny on the top. Oh no, that's the worst. I wish I had this class earlier rather than purchasing all this it's, material because it's not like, it's so that it's not too late. You can, you can still pull it out. <laughs> that's I actually gonna waste my I mean maybe I'll just leave it for like a couple of months and then really pull them out when the weeds actually start growing because I don't know. Now it's already been installed and all pinned down and everything to I guess um, I don't know. So my my advice there is to pull it out sooner than later. Okay. The longer you leave it there, the harder it's going to be to get out. Trust me on this one because okay. you won't be able to find the, the little stakes that they pinned it down with. Uh-huh. Um, you know, if you're worried about weeds, you know, you can do sheet mulching with mm -hmm. cardboard instead. Okay. Um, you know, all those boxes that you get from Amazon or the uh -huh. neighbors get, those things have a purpose. They have a function and that's called sheet mulching. Oh, <laughs> so I didn't know that I had plenty of cardboards on site. <laughs> so um, I, I would definitely uh, get that plastic out of there. Um, plastic has no place in a garden. Uh, how about like those root berries because the city is requiring us to put it along the like my pathways so root barriers to um keep tree roots, roots from lifting yes. up a sidewalk those if they're if they're installed properly do work okay and they okay, do we have installed those and they're like i guess they're really hard kind of plastic yeah but weed mats no oh i wish i had this class earlier i would have saved two grand <laughs> well i will say you know, getting it out now, it, it, it will save you a headache later because those things, they break down um, and then you end up with microplastic in the soil oh, and that okay. migrates when it rains, that goes down, you know, and yeah, microplastic, you just don't want it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again. I appreciate it. <laughs> Sorry for the bad and good news, but um no, no, this was, a, this was, this is helpful. So at least in the future, I know um, I wanted to, I really actually didn't want it. My parents wanted a root barrier. So they said, yeah, go ahead and put it. And they put it. So uh, because my problem is I'm health, um, I have a health issue. So I don't know how, how well I'm going to get along with these plants uh, due to my lung condition. So I might have to just even pull them out, you know, if I can't breathe around them. Well, so a lot of plants, you know, this actually comes up about like, um, uh, you know, am I going to have an allergic reaction to them? So when you have pollinated plants, um, the pollen of flowering plants generally is not wind dispersed um, because the pollinators collect that pollen on their bodies. And that's how the pollen moves around from plant to plant to plant. Things okay. that are wind pollinated, um, those are the things that spew out tons of pollen into the air. So things that have pollinators on them will not be as problematic for you, hopefully, All um, right. as plants that spew out lots of pollen into the wind, hoping to find a recipient for all those male genes. Um, mm -hmm. but most flowering plants are pollinated by insects. And so that pollen 
uh, doesn't get uh, spread into the wind as much. So, so there's, I, I so there's like manzanitas and this, I guess, crepe myrtle. Are those like, um, do yeah. they have pollen or no pollen? So manzanitas do have pollen, but their flowers are tubular shaped. And the okay. pollen is actually inside of that right. tube. So it's very hard for it to get out. Um, crepe myrtle is not a native plant, even though it's like super low uh, water use, it's pretty pollen -y. Um okay. And that's not a plant I recommend for anybody. I do not like crepe myrtles. They have I don't know. I mean, I got like, <laughs> I, I got all the plants that this landscaper has put on and city has approved and I have to put these. I have no other options. <laughs> oh. um, you know, if you have, if you haven't procured the plants, it might Things are cheaper on paper to swap out before you purchase anything. If you haven't purchased the plants. I um, have, I, they're already installed. Oh, I sorry. wish I had this class. I mean, I just found out about this class yesterday and that's why I signed up. But if I knew it earlier, I would have worked. But I did talk to the city lady and she wasn't very helpful in this matter. Well, you know, um, you can, you know, again, if the plants are small, um, mm -hmm. you know, like the crepe myrtle, you might uh, circle back and say, you know, um, we really want to do something that's better for the environment. And we have this other tree in mind um, mm -hmm. that's actually going to be better for me and for my allergies and, you know, whatever health issues. Um, you know, can we swap this one out? Um, I always tell people, you know, it's better to swap out the plants um, early you know, it's really hard after a year or two to get plants out. Yeah. Um, once they once they start growing, you know, yeah. um, then it becomes problematic. But if you only have a few things, you can say, you know, you know, we got this approved. Um, but you know, after doing a little bit more research, you know, can we do this? And you don't have to do it all at once. You know, um, I would do a couple things, but okay. you know, get everything approved on paper that's the cheap thing to do and then do it as you can. Um, you know, Absolutely. don't feel like you have to do everything all at once, you know, take it step by step. Uh -huh. But I would tackle those trees first, uh, crepe myrtle, no. I don't know why this person has put it on there, but. Um, well, you on. know, again, you know, not everybody has the, the training that I have. Um, uh -huh. And so many landscape designers, and landscape architects don't understand the functional significance of native plants and what yeah. they actually do. Um, and so, um, you know, one of the, the plants that I like to recommend a nice tree um, is the Chilopsis linearis, it's the desert willow. Um, a beautiful, it's deciduous. It's a great substitute for a crane mm -hmm. myrtle because it's so low water use and it's deciduous like a crepe myrtle and it has a beautiful orchid-like blossom on it. Okay. You know, and what was the name again? It's Chilopsis linearis, the desert willow. Desert. C-H-I-L-O-P-S-I-S. Okay. Will, yeah. And you I can, will look into it. Yeah. Um, they're a little bit slower growing and actually in Palo Alto at the Unitarian Church on East Charleston. They have a big, beautiful one in their okay. garden. When that thing blooms, I mean, it's covered in these purpley orchid flowers. All right. Why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you want something like that? It's like, I know, I, I wish I had, as I said again and again, I wish I had this class earlier. I have invested all the money and planted everything. It's already been planted and laid out. Well, and well, because I have to do an inspection. Yes. So go through this inspection and she requires exactly T to the T, whatever is on the plan. <laughs> Well, you know, it, remember gardens are dynamic and, yeah. you know, and this is the dynamic portion is like, you know, you can, you can change things out, you know, you may, you, you may get it written, you, like approved and everything like that, but you might just want to just like circle back to the city and mm -hmm. say, can we just pencil in these changes? We would like to try these instead because of this, this reason, that reason, and that reason. Yeah see what happens um and you know i mean what's the worst that can happen is they say no uh, we can suck but um 
But and you know, I've gone through it. I've gone through a couple of times, even talking to the inspector and the main person, landscaper, and their supervisor, and all three have said no to me to switch out a couple of plants I already recommended. Hmm. And they're like, they're being very hard on me, but it's okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I, yeah. I, maybe in the future, I might just change it on my own. I don't know. After having this, I've, I've heard that happens occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate all your guidance and support. Good luck, Sana. Thank you. Um, we have a question from one of our attendees. They are asking, or he said, I would like a fast growing drought tolerant tree to hide a phone pole. I'm okay with buying a larger tree. Do you have any recommendations? Um, so one of the things that I have found that grows pretty fast is um, it's not a tree, it's a shrub, it's Baccarus pilularis, um, and otherwise known as coyote bush. I planted one from a seedling that just popped up in my yard two years ago, and it is 10 feet tall already. I trained it so that it would be more upright and I trained it by tying some twine around it so it was more upright. Um, that's one. Another fast growing one is Lyanothamnus floribundus, which is also called the ironwood. It's not local to here, but they are pretty fast growing. Um, that would be, those would be two suggestions that I have uh, for that kind of thing. Um, then again, you know, if you have a sunny spot, those those things should probably work. Um, you know, not knowing how big of a space you have, um, you know, I would take a look again on the Calscape site to look at your tree options and see what might work. But, you know, Lyanothamnus works really well, I think to kind of block the view of a, of a phone pole. And I, I have a friend who has a native plant garden that's exactly what she planted. And it seems to be doing well. It took about a year and a half to really establish it. Um, but that's a, that's a good one. Um, another one that's not maybe not as fast um, that I think works pretty well is Prunus elicifolia, which is one of the ones that I have um, in my own home garden I showed pictures of. It's a nice evergreen one and it's actually fairly dense. So that one would work well um, to, to hide things. And of course, the, the header millies arbutifolia, the toyon, that's very fast growing. Um, the ones that we planted at the Gwenda Street Garden back in 2017, those are already way over my head. And those are evergreen and they, um, they are very good at hiding things. And you can prune them to a shape, so a single trunk if you want. Awesome, thank you. So if anyone has any other questions, definitely feel free to raise your hand, put it in the chat. Um, yeah. I always tell people, don't be afraid. Um, if something doesn't work, you know, give it a couple of years. Um, if it doesn't work, there's another 8,000 plants to choose from, um, different species. And you know, don't be afraid. Um, you know, plants don't look the same all year long. Some of our California plants um, like to pretend that they're dead and are actually alive. Um, and I have a few of those in my home garden um, that I was certain they were completely dead because they dropped all their leaves during the summer drought. And sure enough, they are sprouting leaves, even in the the deadest looking tips that they have, um, they're sprouting. So, you know, it's just like, okay, you're not dead. You can stay. So, you know, again, you just, the plants, they, they all have these different strategies in terms of how they deal with drought. You know, some of them people say, why are they gray green? And that's a drought strategy, actually. Uh, because you reflect more light. Um, you might be fuzzy. Fuzzy, hairy plants are really good at saving water. Um, 
you know, just a lot of different strategies. Some kind of dry up, shrivel up, but then once it rains, they puff out again. Some drop all their leaves, you know. Um, you know, again, it's like, what, what look do you want to achieve? You want that lush look. There are certainly green, glossy leaves that look lush and nice all the time, um, you know, which is good. I grow a lot of different things. So um, I'm always experimenting, you know, uh, go to native plant nurseries, um, look around. Um, native plant nurseries are really fun to go and visit as well. Um, and, you know, it's because you see things that you don't see, like, you know, in the box nurseries or, you know, the commercial nurseries. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. Well, that's good to know that my plants are not dead. Some of them do look like they're dead. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait till we have a couple of good rains under our belts and then, you know, uh, check them out. And, you know, a lot of plants will start greening up from the base up. And it's amazing when things start to wake up. Great. Thanks again. Any other burning questions? Uh, we do not have anything else in the Q&A. Okay. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Juanita. This was very, very interesting and very informative. Um, yeah. Well, thanks, Samantha. It's mm -hmm. always fun to talk about these things because, you know, for me, I find um, the whole just the whole thing of all of our plants and what they do and their functions. It's, you know, it's a never ending story for me because there's always more that they can show me things that I hadn't imagined before. Um, so, you know, that's, that's what's the beauty of it is that it is always changing and always revealing more gifts along the way. Um, and, you know, why wouldn't you want that? All right. Awesome. Thank you guys all so much for coming today. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, um, this webinar was recorded and it will be posted up on the Bosca Landscape Education class page and also on their YouTube channel. So if you have any other last minute questions, feel free to send them in now. Um, if not, thank you so much for joining. Last chance. <laughs> you know, again, um, feel free to reach out to me um, through, you can message me through the Instagram or Facebook or uh, through the website, primrosewaypollinatorgarden.com. Um, and uh, those, are, those are all ways to uh, get in touch if you have any other uh, lingering questions. Um, Juanita, would you be able to put in your, the, sorry, the um, Instagram username in the chat as well as, maybe I can pull up the website for you. Um, let's see, in the chat, I will put it. That would be. From Roseway Pollinator Garden. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys all for joining. Have a great night. And thank you again, Juanita, for hosting this class with me. My pleasure, Samantha. You take all care. Right. Thank you guys. Have a good night. <laughs>